G'day and welcome to Rob Shed. This week I've been working on Daryl and Suzanne's 1925 Dodge Brothers car and some of the things that make it a bit of a challenge to restore a car of this age is that during the Depression and the Second World War era a lot of these cars were converted into utes and this being a touring car, being the most common body style that was around at the time, most people just took the back doors off, threw all the tub away and put a wooden tray on them and presto you've got a ute. And the reason for that was commercial vehicles would attract more fuel coupons for farmers, business people and people with essential services during the war. So today it's very hard to find the back of a car. Now, like a lot of others, this one had been converted into a ute and it does cause some problems for us. This fender's actually had a piece welded into it to fill in the top of it, to come out to the ute body. The other side one, they'd just riveted a piece of metal onto it, so that was simple enough to get that back to original. What makes it more interesting, that back in the 1920s, the Australian government made a ruling that for every four cars that came into Australia, three of them had to have locally built bodies. So essentially, that's what brought Holden about. They were a car body manufacturing company, which turned into a car manufacturer. There were other companies, uh, Richards for example, they were around, and it also forced Ford to set up a plant in Australia as well. Now, this car, is the one in four. This is a North American bodied car and it's got a body built in Detroit. So it's unique in Australia, very few of them survive and we're missing all the back of the car. So this tub section that I've found for this car, even though it's badly rusted, is off an Australian bodied car and as you can see it's timber framed, it's a coach built body. And all the Australian bodies were timber framed in the doors, all the seat frame and the rear tub section. So I'm going to convert this to a steel frame body to match the front and I'm using a lot of pictures I've downloaded off the internet of um, North American cars and I've blown them up to get details and things like that and there's a few differences uh, where the top mounts on the North American body is a little bit higher up and so there's a pivot point here for the actual top frame and then there's another hole at the back that has a little bracket that fits in there to hold the top when it's folded. Now this tub section I found in a shed out in Calabaran and it had been folded up so the sides were squashed in on themselves and it was buried in the back of the shed under a stack of car wheels and the bloke that I knew out there just said look there's one there somewhere go and have a poke around and after a few hours we found it. So it's rusted beyond use. I'm now using it for a pattern to make new panels. Now the other day I cut this quarter off here now everywhere where the timber's been in it, it's quite badly rotten, so there's actually pinholes all the way through this side here. Now this is a set of unique tools I've made for this car, and they're going to go in my Pullmax machine, and I'll show you that in a minute. The Pullmax has got a reciprocating action, and as it works up and down, you feed your sheet metal through, and it will actually form it into the shape of the tooling. So this is formed to make the bead line on the top of the body here. So this die fits beautifully on the outside, and this other one, fits the inside profile. Now this is the P9 Pullmax and originally these machines were made for cutting profiles into sheet metal because before there was plasma cutters, profile cutters and things like that there was really nothing out in the world for um, cutting a curve. So these were set up with a two axis slide on them and they'd have a pattern table where you'd cut a shape to what you wanted out of wood or whatever you were using and then a pointer would actually run around that and work a big sheet of metal through here and there was a pair of nibbler jaws in here which would just cut the sheet metal to a profile. Now the other feature they had was for running bead lines and all sorts of shapes into sheet metal as well. So if you've got a bit of imagination and can cut a set of tools to the shape you want you can actually make any profile you like on one of these. So I'll just wind this over by hand and this will give you the reciprocating action. It just runs up and down, but it's not really a hammer, it's more a folder. So if you, the bottom tool will adjust up. So as you feed your piece of sheet metal through, you tighten it and tighten it and tighten it until there's just the gap left for the thickness of the sheet metal and it will give you the profile. Now in this case, that's an XB Falcon wheel arch. So that was actually the first set of tools I ever made for this machine. Now, here's a few others I've made over the years. That's a wheel arch for a HR Holden. So that's the little profile where it comes down off the side of the car, comes out to the point, and then tucks in above the wheel. Same thing again, but this is for a HG Holden wheel arch. Some of the more complicated ones, 
This is the bottom of a door frame for a Volkswagen Beetle. And yes, it will shape a piece of metal into the shape of this tool all the way around. This will eventually form the bead line on the top of our Dodge body. Now, the bead line that runs along the top here will be formed with these tools. So it's just going to follow this edge that I've already put on it in the pull mech. So it'll just work its way around and that will form the bead line at the top of the panel. Now on the North American body, where this little hole is for the top to hinge on, it's actually got a little divot that shapes around there. So I'll either do that by hand or I'll just machine up a little tool that I can use like a hammer and dolly to work together to form that little half moon on the bottom there and the same where the top support goes at the back. Way back in the 1980s when I first got interested in shaping sheet metal, I had to find tools. Now, when you live 150 miles south of the world's most remote capital city, there's not a lot of sheet metal equipment laying around. So I made all this. Now this is my bead roller that I built probably back in 1984, 1985. And the gear drive in here is actually two second gears out of a Model A Ford gearbox because I had them laying around. And all the tooling that I've acquired over the years I've just machined up on my little lathe. And the same with the wheeling machine. I couldn't find one for love nor money so it was a case of make one but I needed to use it so it was made in a hurry. It sort of works well so it's been left alone. It's not the world's greatest wheeling machine but it gets the job done. Here's another interesting thing that happened during the week. I was welding but I was getting a lot of oxidisation on my weld and immediately you think that, okay, there's a gas pressure problem. So I checked the gas pressures, everything's fine. I even adjusted the gas pressure up to higher than where I normally run it, but it didn't fix it. So the next thing I looked at was the little gas diffuser in here. And it turns out small particles of metal had blocked off some of the holes where the gas was coming through. And that was enough to cause a problem for the weld. So it was a simple fix. I took it apart, cleaned it, put it back together again. But then as I'm thinking about it, I had caused the problem because I'm in the habit of taking the shield off when it builds up with a bit of rubbish in the end of it and just putting it on backwards and rolling it on there to break the little pellets of metal and stuff away and they're getting stuck in the breather holes. So there's a little trap for your MIG welder. If you're having some gas issues, check your diffuser. Now, sometimes with restoring old cars, you're going to get caught a little bit with things you don't expect. And this is one of these cases here. Now I've worked around this fender and I've put pieces in it all over the place. So it's had a, a new piece put up the front here. It's had corners down the back. Where it attaches on the running board, there's another piece gone on. And all this top section over here had packed up with mud underneath the um, mounting bracket and rusted away. But also over its life it had a severe crack through here. So I've done a lot of work on it already. But when I sandblasted it, more rust. Now this was completely hidden by flaky paint and scaly rust and bits and pieces in there and I'd spotted a couple of little pinholes and I'd thought later on that I would just get there and spot them up with the welder. But once I sandblasted it, this whole piece is rotten. So I'm going to make another set of tools for the pull max and this is the start of it. Now what's going to happen is there'll be a flat washer welded onto here and this little domed portion will be the hammer part in the pull max and it will run along the back side of the piece of metal and form this nice bead line. But because this is actually in full view from the front of the car and it's got the same on the other side of the car, you can actually be in a position where you can see both of them. So this really needs to match exactly side to side or you're going to notice a discrepancy. So I'm getting a piece of metal machined which will form a slider and it's going to sit on a little table that we're going to make and it's going to slide backwards and forwards with the piece of sheet metal to form this really nice precise bead line. Now the other problem that there is, there's this decorative line around the edge of the panel here. Now over the years it's been damaged, it's been bent, it's, and I didn't even know it was there to start with because 
it was just buried under the paint. There was that much paint material on here that it was completely smooth over the top of that lip. So I'm going to make another little Pull Max tool that will actually just redefine this lip and we'll put the fender in it and actually run down this edge here and across the front and it'll make a new precise line on there and it'll be really nice when the car's painted up. So that's been a bit of my week in the shed. I'm Rob Teal. Thank you very much for watching.